thank you everybody to being, uh, for being connected with us today and uh, welcome to this session, uh, this dialogue within the Leading Complex Times uh, Dialogue Series, uh, which uh, I um, well, uh, decided to, to launch uh, with, the, with the single aim of, of sharing insights, tools, uh, and, and um, useful information with all of you in these different times we live in. Okay, so uh, the whole IE is involved, and today we are lucky enough to have the uh, School of Architecture and Design. Okay. And uh, even more lucky to have two of the important people in the, in the school, uh, David Goodman. David is the director of uh, the Bachelor in Architectural Studies and uh, Roberto, Roberto Molinos, who is the director of the Advanced Program in Built Tech. Right? They're both professors and they're going to talk about uh, architecture and remote, right? So this is our session today. Uh, Roberto and, and David are going to start with the conversation and um, we'll open uh, some time for questions and answers at the, at the end of the, uh, of the session. So you can write your uh, questions uh, on the chat and Roberto and, and, uh, and David will be, will be uh, talking back and, and, and answering the questions. Okay, so thank you, David. Roberto, the arena is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria, thank you. Um, so everybody, I think I'd, I'll just get things started today. Uh, you'll notice that Roberto is, is joining us from the deck of the uh, Starship Enterprise. I am here in the, uh, the Stanley Kubrick wing of the Interstellar Hilton uh, in 1968. So I thought that, that this was a, a great way to, to uh, begin a conversation about being remote uh, because we are separated by, you know, I don't know how many different years separate where the, where the Starship Enterprise is at any given moment, but, but an infinite number of years and a lot of, a lot of kilometers. Um, but today we're going to talk about remoteness uh, and, and collaboration across space and across time. And uh, architecture and design, I think, are uniquely positioned uh, in that for quite a long time, right? Probably uh, since as long as people have been making drawings of buildings, um, architecture has a relationship of distance to its object. That is, uh, the minute we make a drawing of something, we're communicating to a person who we don't necessarily even know, uh, who may uh, interpret those drawings to make a building. So we are already separated. And this has been going on since, well, the Renaissance, before the Renaissance, right? Uh, it's not new. What is new are these tools that we currently have to collaborate. And we're gonna structure our conversation uh, around three pillars that, that Roberto proposed. I think they're, 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 they're the right ones to use in a conversation like this. We're gonna talk about practice. So how does remoteness affect the way we work together um, in an architecture office, in a design office? How uh, does that affect architecture education? And this is uh, related very much to IE School of Architecture and Design in IE University broadly. And third is, is Technology itself, the technology itself as the object. Uh, and I wanted to, to start with a question uh, for Roberto, because in addition to uh, being director of the Build Tech program, Roberto is also founder and CEO of a firm called Modelical. And I wonder, uh, Roberto, if you could talk about how um, remoteness, how distance and technology work in your firm. Right, of course. Um, thank you, David, for the introduction. And it's a pleasure being here with all of you. Um, besides Teaching at, the, at school, I would consider myself first a teacher and then a practitioner. Uh, at the office at Modelical, what we try to do is we try to help architects and other professionals at the, at the, in, in this sector to use technology for their benefit. And uh, not only the design technologies themselves, basically parametric design and BIM and computational design, but also collaboration technologies and communication technologies. And, we try to 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 uh, to preach uh, what we actually do, and 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 the office is fully remote, and at this moment, of course, but we were rather prepared from from day one to be to be remote, and it's and and we've seen in, in our clients and our customers in the last days a huge a huge change towards the use of technology beyond BIM and beyond uh, parametric design and beyond the, the the core technology that we that we work with them. Uh, they have embraced these uh, remote ways of working in a way that I would say needs some reflection. And I would like to discuss with you about that uh, further, further, further on. So, yeah, I think that both of the 
uh, what I do at the at the school and what I do professionally uh, outside the school are pretty much connected to the to, to people working collaborating in large projects across the globe, going from the design board to construction side. Uh, so we have a, a I'd say a pretty decent idea of what's of what's going on out there, especially on the later stages of design. But I would like also to discuss other other stages of the design with you and also with the, with the audience. I think those those uh, multiple stages of design. It, this is a, an overlap uh, of the two chapters of this conversation where we talk about education and we talk about practice. Because uh, in a lot of the conversations I have with people involved in architecture education, people are confused as to how you could possibly do early stage design, conceptual design, uh, collaboratively across distance, right? Mm -hmm. um, and this is this is something that, that that you have some experience with, both in school and uh, and professionally. Can you tell us yeah. a yeah. little bit about yeah. that? Yeah, I think there's a there's a I mean, this is the first thing I, I throw to the to the floor for for reflection is like we are we can we can discuss ideas, let's say in, in two big ways, right? We can discuss ideas synchronously, like we're doing now. We're watching each other, although through a video conference, and we have a chat, so anybody can ask us almost anything in real time. So we can discuss ideas in real time synchronously, right? Paying attention to the other. But then we can discuss ideas after some kind of individual reflection in a more asynchronous way. We can we can write them down, we can we can we can crunch them, we can we can think around them, we can just sleep them to uh, sleep over them, right? And then transmit them. That is something that is I I'd say that is something that almost Oh, happens always in in our in our sector because when we draw, when we model, it takes a it takes a lot of time, right? It takes time to draw something compelling that is complete. What I'm trying to say is that you cannot chat a drawing, right? You can chat over an idea, but you cannot chat over a drawing. The technology is is, is trying to help us with that, but I don't think it's it's been successful. Uh, we've seen many many trials on on getting collaborative modeling. On uh, and 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 this idea development in, in the early stages, but I think it takes a bit of a reflection and 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 autonomous work to do that, and and that is something I would like to bring to other areas of the collaboration in the practice. Right, that time that time you spend with yourself, with your ideas, sketching, tinkering, and that it's that is something I see missing in many many other areas of the architectural practice on the management and business development at this time. It's interesting, right? Because that what you're saying is that the slowness or the potential slow th th there's a delay in this process, right? Absolutely. And I don't yeah. mean I don't mean the delay in, in, in signal. I mean sort of a delay in you send something to me, I send something to you. Uh, uh, or if we're, we're we're you know we're we're having a conference that one needs to prepare for that conference like a meeting, mm -hmm. uh, and maybe you you do get that sort of moment of reflection or slowness. I remember you know. Where I'm going to date myself, right? when when we're in the early days of CAD, uh, people would lament um, how immediate it was to make that yeah. that digital line, right? Already with a measure, already with you know, um, with hierarchy of, of where it stood in the building, what layer it was on, versus the pencil, which required a certain slowness or abstraction. Absolutely, maybe, yeah. Maybe we and there there was something to that, right? Because in that slowness, there was thought. Right? It wasn't so immediate. You had to think about it and you had, you had a delay. And so maybe in some way our working remotely does give us that sort of delay. Or it also may give us room for interpretation because if I'm not exactly there, you may productively misunderstand me, which takes us to a place we wouldn't have gotten otherwise if we understood mm -hmm. the purpose mm -hmm. of explaining myself. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I'm thinking of the... I mean, of the uh, Pawson House by Frank Lloyd Wright. I, I, I bought some years ago a book that collected all the letters exchanged between the client, Rose Pawson, and, and, and the architect. And you can see that actually that, that house was built in a, in a way that now it would, be, would seem amazing. It was, it was all built, all the, everything was decided over letters, written letters that would take days to reach the destination. Uh, many of those letters included a request for payment from Mr. Mr. Wright for, to, 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 to his client. Uh, but the reality is that we have, I think we've lost that. We've lost that in every, in every area we could lose that, right? We've lost that in the technical design, on the discussions, also on site, we've lost that. Um, we, I think it only remains in areas where it's almost impossible to be 
to work collaboratively, which is basically sketching on your own out there. So yeah, there's a, there's a sense of slowness to the design process and there's a sense of intimacy that it's, it's really, really good for working remote because it allows you to work on an idea, develop it to a certain extent, work on how you're gonna present that idea and then throw it, send it to the other people, right? I don't think the problem with the tools is that the tools per se are worse. The, the thing is that we haven't put much thought on how we use those tools, right? So we can still work in CAD alone, we can still model alone, but then it seems, since, since it seems like everything can be shared in real time, we feel tempted to do so, All, even if it's not something that is not good to do, right? Even if in the beginning you are just, you have, you have to work with yourself, speak to yourself, develop the idea, develop the design, whatever it is, it's, if it's urban planning or the detailed design, whatever it is. Um, I think there's a, in, in architecture, it's easier just to work on your own until you get something that is worth sharing with the, with the rest. Uh, whereas in other, other areas of the business, when you are talking about re constraints or requirements from the client or communication things, right? You, you, you have a highly synchronous way of working that in my view, it's becoming a bit of a nightmare. I would like to ask the audience how, how much time have they spent lately on video conferences a day, right? It's like, it seems like all the friction that we had to hold a meeting has been put away. And now we spend the whole day into 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 video conference. And no matter what you're doing, right? I'm I'm spending video conf I'm spending time in the conference from 8 a.m. till 8 8 p.m. Uh, and and then I, and, and then I go so what what kind of work did I do today? I didn't do anything productive. I was I was always in a meeting, and it's it, I, I I'm actually an advocate. I we have to recover this this notion of asynchronous way of working that we had in in architecture. Uh, long before the COVID and long before the technology exploded. Yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, I, 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 I agree. You know, our days now are spent in, in one amorphous uh, meeting. And I really do think that this is in part because we're trying desperately to recreate a, a closeness we had. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, um, that may not be the way to think about it. You're suggesting that actually, and I, I think I agree with you, that there is something specific to this way of living. You know, we live isolated and we come together at moments where it's necessary, not to reproduce this idea of I'm working in, in an open space where you're right over there normally, so I need to have that, uh, that, that connection. Um, yeah, and I would agree, I, I, I'm not sure it's really helping. I'll bring it back to education just for a moment. Mm -hmm. When um, when we are in um, the online mode of our semester, and we've been doing it for quite a while, we have different ways of doing it. One of them is uh, video conference, which roughly reproduce, re recreates the, the classroom setting or the studio setting. Okay, yeah. there's that, which people understand. And that's going on everywhere. The other, which is actually more interesting, is the forum. Right? And a forum is an asynchronous way of collaborating. And I always liked the forum as a professor of history and theory. I liked it because the student who may not have been able to formulate a clear idea in class in the moment, uh, or the student who was more shy or just didn't have the, that personality, could take the time to think and compose you know, a response that had a beginning, a middle, and end, mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. and it was crafted. And so one good participation, you know, or two a day, really, and, and from all of the students, really created a much more vibrant classroom experience, but we were not trying to recreate the classroom we had. So I and think- it's, And it's repeatable, right? It's something you can get back to later on. Yeah. When you're done with the class. You can go back to your notes, you can go back to the forum, you can go back to those, that writing. And, and no matter how much tools we have, I think writing, it's something that needs to be, uh, promoted much more and, and and David I wanted to ask you because of the of the pandemics and, and, and the change to fully remote although the school was already uh, partially remote uh, during one of the semesters what 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 benefits ha, ha, have have been this have you discovered like unexpected benefits have you have you have you gotten from this situation uh, for the students and for the and for the for the for the yeah for the learning uh, of them, yeah. Well, look, I don't want to minimize the, the real struggles that a lot of us are going through um, and a lot of our students. Uh, so so there's, there's 
a very dire environment going on. Let's not, let's not make light of it, but there are certain things here that I think we're learning. Uh, and when this passes, and it will pass, mm -hmm. um, that we will be wiser in many ways. I'm going to give one that I think is a very personal thing. Uh, slowing down somewhat um, does help you think about certain priorities in, in your own life. Right? Mm -hmm. I think uh, the running from place to place constantly, um, having to sit <laughs> uh, is good. And I think this also speaks to your earlier point about the pace of architecture. Sometimes the pace of uh, when you can have those moments of thinking, uh, they're not running everywhere hmm. is, is, is useful. And I think some of our students have actually, I see, especially in design studios, a much more tenacious uh, hunger for a beautiful or a rich or a provocative or a good project because I think it's something they they they, they can now pour all of the energy into all right and I see that it it's it's a way to keep normal life moving forward it's a way to continue the rhythm of life when when you know they were here in Segovia and suddenly they're in Costa Rica uh, mm -hmm. with their parents uh, uh, and their classmates are all over the world. Our students are from 60 different countries. So um, I think it's a, it's, that's been one benefit. The students have a new, I think, uh, hunger for, for architecture. And, and, and I see it in, in, in the work of the students. Okay. I, I, well, I, I would like to ask you a bit more about the way we do things at the school and in the, in the great undergrad program you run. But I would like to, then, before that, I would like to reflect a bit more about the practice. Like, I'd like to ask you about the, the challenges that we are facing once this is once this is over, right? We as architects and and as as professors and as academics, we have to th rethink how we're gonna how we're gonna teach and what kind of uh, values or uh, what kind of uh, techniques we're gonna we're gonna teach the to students as well. But I would like to ask you on the floor is how how do you think this is gonna change? And I would like not only from a point of view of how we're gonna work. Of course, we we will be working more remote. Seems so. Uh, not only about the work from a workplace point of view, but also about the one, there's one important thing I, I like to address this to the floor is the business development of the practice, right? Is how do we create businesses? Because as professional services firms or professionals that we, where we are actually running many things at the same time, we're running the design, we're running the accounting, we're running the, we're running the business development. There, there are, there are, there are issues with the, with that, that I don't think we are prepared to, right? And I'm sure maybe, I'm sure, I mean, if there's one school that is actually helping students, uh, helping architects, not only undergrad students to, to actually uh, improve their skills there is, is our school. But like, what are the challenges that you see for the practice once this is over, right? Once this is done? Well, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's the question, right? Because eventually uh, these conditions will be lifted. I think I, I want to draw a little bit on my own research. Yeah. Um, I, I've researched... Uh, 90 years of architecture practice in Chicago, and I did a kind of quantitative study of uh, how architecture dealt with crisis. In this case, it was the Great Depression uh, and the Second World War. So how did architects deal with this? And which architects survived this crisis, right? So we're in this crisis now. Let's say this is phase two of the crisis that began in 2008, right? The shaking of the profession. Um, so for, for, for business development, I mean, one of the things that I found in this research is that um, a lot of things that architects would have thought were, I don't know if illegitimate is the word, but, but strategies that were looked down upon maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, at the time in the 1920s, 30s, it was really looked down upon for any architect to get into contracting in any way, general contracting, or even offering engineering services. That was a different thing. But those taboos were lifted. And the firms that survived and that were founded in this moment of great crisis, and one of them uh, two of them are, are American firms, SOM uh, based in Chicago and Perkins and Will, international firms that were in my study. They realized in this weird moment where taboos had maybe been lifted that they could successfully depart from those strategic taboos. Okay, mm -hmm. we can do things that we couldn't do otherwise. So I think one of the keys now for business development is to say, okay, a lot of the truths that we kind of internally just assume to be the way it practices, maybe we can begin to question those, even at the risk of being seen as, I don't know if illegitimate is the word, but um, unorthodox in a way that might not seem, you know, that's not what an architecture firm does. Right? We're stepping outside the boundaries of what one does. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the keys. The challenges I think will be to fight um, or to find a way to work with. I think there will be another, I, I, we're already seeing it, a tendency to, to kind of 
uh, avoid these dependencies on, on, on travel and avoid dependencies on, on supply chains that are, are international. And, and there will be, there could be a return to a much more localist approach, which is strange because we're just getting these tools to work at distance. But mm -hmm. um, that will be, I think, one of the challenges. I mean, what, what do you see in, 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 your, in your practice? Well, I see that as an opportunity for the smaller firms. And when I say smaller, I mean like almost the unipersonal firms, right? Where there's just one person or two persons, right? Running the company that they can, using this, the tools which are more or less democratic, they can, they can uh, collaborate with other, other companies, smaller companies around the world and create these kind of networks that allow them to go for big projects. Because the, re the reality, and I'm speaking from my national experience here, because in Spain, we, had, we don't have a, we have a, we have great architects, we have great architectural offices, but most of them are rather small, right? And it happens all over the world, actually. The, 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 our sector, especially for architectural studios, are really scattered, are really small, right? Uh, in Spain, but also in, in, in Europe, uh, a 50 people architectural studio is, is, is a big one already, mm -hmm. right? So I, what I see is that, okay, we, are, we, have a, we, have a, we have a sector, we have a group of practices which are, are rather small, but how they can go for bigger projects. Maybe they can, they can use these tools and they can use this sensitivity towards working remote and towards working in a geographically dispersed way that, that, the, that the COVID has, has raised to, to create these uh, kind of clusters or unions or, I don't know, you could call it joint ventures. So you can get the best interior designer to work with the best, uh, I don't know, uh, bicycle transit or bicycle transportation consultant, right? And you can assemble very good, uh, really, really good teams outside the big, the big companies, right? The big companies have it, have it done. I think they are, they are struggling a lot with, uh, with the change, but I can see the, the business development, it's a, it's a, it's a big challenge. Uh, there are, there are, the way we create new, new commissions and new opportunities for us in a remote way, it's a challenge also, it's, a, it's an exciting one because then you're suddenly not restrained to work in your close environment. If you're gonna work this way, you can decide to go and know and bid for projects anywhere, right? You, don't, you might not need to be there as you would if you had a, a in, in a different scenario. So it's also, it will also allow you to hire, uh, to hire a talent everywhere, right? It's like, okay, you can suddenly, sure hire someone in India and then that work in India from Spain or from the, from, from France, from wherever you want to, you want to be. And you can create these networks where the technology is not a problem. The technology is already there. But again, I think there, a lot of communication needs to be, it's to be nurtured in a different way than what we're doing now. Right. It's like you long, uh, good, good writing, having the right marketing strategies, uh, creating proposals that are compelling. They are using the technology in, a, in the proper way you could use, virtual reality presentations, you can use uh, immersive video, you can use different technologies that are already existing but are not really used now. I just like, I think are a complement at the moment, but they will become more and more important. So what you're saying here, and I, one of the, 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 the people in the chat there, Pamela says that, you know, that, that this kind of collaboration is a way for small firms to maybe equal the, get on an equal playing field, right? Because you can become a big firm very quickly with these collaborations. Hmm. This was happening. I think, I mean, this was already happening, right? Mm -hmm. um, so one way to look at this is that, that this is just this kind of an accelerator, right? For something that was already, already happening. Um, let me be the dark cloud here. Yeah, right? please go. Um, yeah. The dark cloud says, yeah, okay, that's great. Um, but that means also that certain parts of the design process could become utterly commodified. Like, you know, just go for the lowest price we can get anywhere. Mm -hmm. I don't have to be near the person. Who will do it the cheapest? Yeah. Right. And it could be one more step. How do we fight that, right? Because if all of your work could just as easily be outsourced or, or to someone who has no, no link to your community at all, what, um, what, um, what do we do? Well, I, have a, I, have a, I think I have an answer for that. I mean, of course, we, we, are, we are always drift by the market, right? I mean, we are competing in a, in, a, in a global market where you are not competing with the, with the guy next door. No, you're suddenly competing in a pool where there are people from all the, all the countries that have the same skills as you do, but they are cheaper or they have, they have, they have bigger tax forces, right? But what, what we need to do as architects is like, okay, we are, we, are, we are great creators of knowledge, knowledge of different types, right? Design knowledge, technical knowledge. We also have this kind of experience knowledge, right? That you only get 
by being on site or by being there. And I don't think we have paid much attention to capturing that knowledge at a practice level, I'm talking, right? So mm -hmm. when you do that, when you create pro pro processes and procedures and you create, when you capture what you've done in the projects, the lessons learned, something that are really best practices, but I don't think many companies follow at the moment, not even the big ones. When you capture that, you are able to compete in the market without losing your, your edge or losing your, um, your signature, right? And then you can become, you can, you can actually, you can, I think you can counter, you can, you can uh, confront the, the market drift, right? But the problem is that if you don't do that, you're definitely gonna be just measured by the price, by how, how expensive you are, and you will be paid by the hour, which is, uh, it's dramatic most of that, right? So these technologies and also the collaboration side of the, of the discussion needs to, needs to address certainly the topic of how do we deal with the knowledge we create on the projects, on the design, how do we evaluate our, 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 our buildings? How do we learn from them, right? And then that is the, the, the kind of collaboration I want to discuss, where I would be interested in discussing, right? That, that way we can, we, can, we can overcome the market drift, I mean, right? So with knowledge management would be one, one of the, one of the key things. Of course, there are, I mean, there are, there are um, there's a there's there's a study a complete study by by it's a professor from Harvard called De Long, and uh, who, who speaks a lot about professional services firms. I will I will share with you the the reference the the, the book reference afterwards. I think it's it's extremely important that we address this idea of capturing the knowledge as a as a solution as a system to avoid being drifted into commodity. There's a a really important comment that we I just saw here in the, in in the chat, you know, a lot of what we're saying is uh, to a small segment of the world, people who have band access and a laptop at all times. Um, so we're, we're talking about a kind of generalization of, of practices, but that's not, that's not globally applicable, right? We're talking about uh, a certain uh, sub-segment, right? Um, mm -hmm. Looking at me, I, I seem to have been frozen there for a second. Yeah. Um, so I think, I mean, also speaks to a uh, high lowism that, okay, um, we may not all have connection, uh, and with th this so about, uh, digital connection may not be applicable to everybody. And yeah. I'm I don't know if you've lost the- Sorry, I, I, I've disappeared. Uh, yes, suddenly, yeah. I was vaporized yeah. here. It's 2001, anything can happen here. Yeah. <laughs> Kubrick land. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, what Omeima was saying, it's, it's extremely important. I mean, we, we're working with uh, companies and, 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 and teams in Africa and, and the Middle East where the connection is not that good. Uh, where we, we, from Europe and the US, we, we take for granted certain things that are not so straightforward right not everybody has the right working environment at home right it's a it's a crazy reflection uh, reflection like okay you think you can bring any you can send anyone home but that not might be the best case for them right the, the, they might not be prepared they might not have the right access uh the infrastructure might not be might not be ready and then and it's extremely important to be sensitive to these ideas these concerns although the world is at this at this point is is actually leveling up Pretty, pretty quickly. I mean, you, of course, 5G is becoming a, a, a technology that is helping a lot. It's gonna help a lot there, especially for the developing countries. But it's just, we still have this gap between, the, the, between some countries and, 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 and others where you cannot have that, that amount of, of technology working properly. I want, we've got some questions here talking about, you know, what, what could be next uh, trends in design. And I think, you know, I, I don't know, I don't know if I, I would feel uh, qualified to, to predict those things, but I wonder if you think, Roberto, if there's a way that um, um, spending so much time together and alone, together and separately, will lead to, um, you know, we've been in this virtual space, let's mm -hmm. say, right? We, and uh, to a certain degree, architects haven't been very much involved in the design of that virtual space. No, we um, haven't. In gaming, perhaps a bit. But that's a place where we, we're all spending lots of time. We're spending lots of time in our kitchens and our bedrooms and, and things like this. But 
we're spending tons of time in this virtual space. What do you see uh, as the opportunities for architects and designers in the design of that space? Well, there are, I think there are opportunities on, in the short term, in the long term. Of course, short term, I think we're going to see a much, much bigger uh, drive for everything that needs to be, that has to do with healthcare and, and, and actually mixing this kind of a working environment with the, with the living environment. I don't think, I think we're going to start seeing that, that mixture more and more or clients being sensitive to that as well. Um, but there is also, uh, this, this concept of, uh, of, uh, how are we going to, how are we going to live a life where, where what we do with the domestic tasks and work tasks are going to be intertwined so much and the workplace, especially the workplace, it's going to change. I mean, because we will not, we will not uh, sanctify the, the workplace as we do now, right? We will just maybe uh, focus more on, get, on having a workplace that has certain meaning that is not ready to do everything there, but has a special meaning so you go you go to the office and you have certain specific tasks or certain specific activities in there rather than doing everything in there right um, also schools will need to reflect on the uh, on this and i think we we will have to have a much much bigger more much much leading a much like a much more leading role in that and i don't think i always think architects are we are a bit uh like uh, focus on the on tiny things, and we 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 try we tend to miss the, the bigger picture in this, and then others come and decide for us. But we have to decide. I mean, we are the ones who have to decide, have, have to describe, has to have to design the workplace of the future, the health the healthcare place of the future, the living place of the future, and we have to think in those terms now as something that has completely changed because of this of the of, this, of the pandemic. And and what we what we see more and more is that this thing will happen again. Uh, and probably will happen again while we are alive. No, it's not. It's not going to happen in 100 years or 50 years. It might mm -hmm. happen, in, say, in 15, 15 years. So we must be ready for that. Uh, we can see that the uh, senior senior life is. is I mean, in, in developing in developed countries, uh, the, the problem has been with the seniors mo mostly. No, it's like the the elders. It's like how the uh, the residences and how the uh, senior housing has been has to change uh, to uh, to accommodate these these situations. You know, it, 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 there's a comment here from uh, Raphael saying, you know, that, 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 that there is a certain premium, not, an, not an, a limitless premium that, that, that they might, uh, one might be willing to offer for local knowledge, um, but, but that, that this will lead to some kind of revaluing of these things, right? Revaluation re of, of what local knowledge and local experience and connections mean. I want to bring this to, to the last... Um, there was a moment, let's say, in the, at the end of the 20th century, I remember that, <laughs> old enough to remember, there was this, as, as uh, the internet was beginning to, to appear and people began to be able to tele, telework, right, uh, telecommute and, and have uh, online meetings, this was new. Uh, and there was this prediction that, you know, business travel will be destroyed, uh, you know, in the late 1990s, you know, biz, there will be no more business travel. Mm -hmm. Well, something kind of perverse happened, right? Uh, actually, it made it, the fact that you could telecommute or go to a meeting online made it even more valued for you to get on that plane and, 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 and go somewhere. Because if you showed up, that meant that you really mm -hmm. cared, right? Mm -hmm. because, uh, and it was almost, you know, it almost incentivized more the face-to-face -face contact or it made it more special, right? Um, it made it more special because, you know, just precisely because we could be talking through a screen. The fact that I went to the bother to be face to face. I'm wondering if um, something analogous might happen, not with that tendency, because I think, I think we really will, for many reasons, not only, not only related to health risks, but also carbon emissions. I think we will probably have to cut down on, on some of our elective business travel. But the other thing is, well, what about our public spaces? Because maybe this will lead us to value these public spaces more or even more, right? And I was speaking with a, a colleague who's in Amsterdam and they have different quarantine restrictions. They're allowed to go out uh, into public spaces provided they leave two meters between people. And here in Spain, we're not allowed to do this. Hmm. But she said, you know, she's never seen public spaces so productively used, public spaces that she didn't even think of as public spaces. People were out there enjoying them with, with six feet between them, but, but enjoying them. I'm wondering if you think that there might be room for us also, expanded room in the field 
for work um, in the real world, right? So the virtual world is one. Where are the new opportunities in the physical world that might be accentuated, do you think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, was, I was actually seeing a video of, a, of an empty studio today and I was actually focusing on, on, the, on the tiles on the ground and how, how I mean, and I thought, well, somebody thought about that. Uh, I mean, you could see the tiles like properly placed and, and I thought, well, somebody thought about that and somebody put, and, and I thought, wow, how, what would I give to be actually walking down that road, that, that <laughs> the street at this very moment, no? So yeah, I think it's going to be, uh, there's going to be more, more, uh, there's going to be like uh, more sensitive, more, yeah, we're going to be more sensitive to the, to the role of public space. Um, of course, the, the, there's, a, there's a big debate about density. I mean, what has happened with density? Has it killed us? I mean, has, has it been the problem, the density? But at the end of the day, I think, I think we, we, we are animals, right? And, and we, like, we like speaking to each other. We like gossip. We like sitting next. We like seeing the other in the face. Uh, we, need, we need to have this uh, non-verbal communication going on. I mean, it's, it's half of it at least, right? So we, I, th I don't think that's going to that's gonna, like, gonna be uh, dismissed completely whatsoever, right? No, not at all, but um, it will give us more opportunities to make it meaningful, right? To make it something that it's meaningful. Um, I wondered about sports, sports events, gathering events. It will be, it will be meaningful, right? But at the same time, we will just be consuming more and more on that online. Uh, Esports, I'm sure are gonna, are gonna rush after this because they are, they are the only ones who haven't stopped uh, with the pandemic, right? That they are and, and they are they are growing. It's a huge, it's a massive uh, market, and also for us, it could be for us as well, right? Mm -hmm. so, mm, I think they, I think we will we shall be able to make public space and works work work uh, workspace a more meaningful uh, experience because it will be optional, right? It will be. I think it's gonna they're gonna it's gonna become optional for many of us. Of course, not for everybody, but for many of us, it's gonna become something optional. So if I want to have a bit, if I want to if I want to have an office, I want it to be meaningful. I want it to be much better than what everybody has at home, right? Also, there's gonna be um, uh, I think it's gonna be an affection a problem with the high paying jobs. I, I mean, you're American. I would like to ask you about the uh, what's going on in Silicon Valley, right? Silicon Valley has been has been has had a, a huge bubble, a uh, real estate bubble. It's almost impossible to, to rent a house there. And we've seen something on a much smaller case in, in bigger, bigger, bigger uh, cities in, in Europe. We, have, we already have that in Madrid, actually, right? I mean, an average, average architect working in Madrid cannot afford to have like a huge house or apartment unless he goes like 30 kilometers away from the city. But if we embrace this remote work, we might be able to provide people with a opportunity to go back to their like hometowns, uh, establish their practices there, maybe spend some time like traveling, but have their hometown and, and have a much better quality of life, uh, making use of architecture in their hometown, right? In, 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 smaller, in smaller cities. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if, 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 if you think it's, that is gonna happen or how can we, how can we help that happen? Sure. Um, well, living as I do on a rotating tube uh, in orbit just off the, the, the coast of Mars, uh, I, I, I can say a few things about, you know, living off the, off the grid. Um, no, I mean, I, I live uh, in Segovia, and I think cities like Segovia, uh, cities that um, are metropolitan, right? I'm, I'm 25 minutes on a high-speed train from the big city, but it's, it's very true in a moment like this, I am grateful for the fact that I can look out my window and see the horizon and see wheat and, and know that when I can finally take my children for a walk in four days, uh, mm -hmm. that I can get out of the city walking, you know, I, I can leave the city walk. And I think there will be, I am hoping there will be, because I think it would be healthy for there be, to be a rethinking of what is the metropolis. The metropolis can include, in a way, it's a return to certain garden city principles, right? Uh, mm -hmm. um, that may repopulate parts, at least in, in Spain, that are, are, are losing population, uh, these, these provincial capitals that have a great quality of life and are now connected physically. I think um, there's been uh, a prejudice toward the big metropolis, and, and this has happened in many places. I was reading an article in the New York Times the other day about New York City and how there's been this sort of return of a lot of people to, their, to, their, to the towns where they come from, 
cities like Pittsburgh or Cleveland, right? And these cities that have been losing population that more and more, even before this, because of uh, uh, the property bubble, right? Uh, people are moving to these sort of second or third tier cities, mm -hmm. which are still communicated to the big cities. And, mm -hmm. and I think for many reasons, this, well, certainly teleworking makes that possible, right? Um, and I think that, that we may rethink what the good life is. Um, and it may, we may sacrifice, as I do here in Segovia, you know, I certainly don't have the same number of good, uh, good restaurants. Uh, yeah. <laughs> certainly I mean, you have, pretty, want, you know, you have pretty good restaurants, actually. Okay. You can't not if, you want Mexi if, you want, if you want Mexican food, not so good. All right. <laughs> <laughs> true, 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 true. If you're looking for a good Thai place, you're not going to find it. Um, mm. But but there's other things that we gain, and maybe I was saying earlier, maybe this is causing us to, to re, you know, maybe just adjust our priorities a, a little bit. Um, I want to. I would like to maybe shift. We have maybe 15 more minutes before we open the questions, or 10 minutes, and I'd like to talk about education a bit because there have been some questions uh, in the chat. Yeah, let's do it for five minutes, and I think we should then open to the chat. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about education a bit because. Um, a lot of, you know, there's a question here from, from Lorenzo asking, you know, should we move lecture th theory classes online? And I'm, I'm understanding online um, no matter what, right? And I think that increasingly we're going to have to stop differentiating between face-to-face -face and online. It's just going to be learning and we adopt probably different methodologies for different reasons. And, and I, I, I would say that IE has been doing this in a way with blended programs for a while, that there are certain moments where you need to come together for certain kinds of learning. Mm -hmm. uh, other learning is best done through a forum. Uh, other learning is best done, we'll probably have some kind of virtual campus uh, where we can actually you know, work together in a virtual design studio. Um, but I'm wondering, what, what do you think, um, what do you think will be the, um, how will we make decisions, let's say, about how to deliver coursework? Because for now, we're being told precisely how we have to do it. Mm -hmm. The world is telling us, do it this way. But eventually, it will no longer tell us that, and we will all have learned how to do it this way. Will we just go back to the way things were? What, what do you think we can, we can carry with us in terms of uh, teaching? Well, I think, that, I think there's a, there are lots of things we can we can we can connect from the from the school to the practice uh, in terms of uh, of how do how do we approach problems and how do we approach design issues and how do we how do we approach learning and, and capturing? I think, of course, as I said as I said before, more writing, more reflective work, more reflective drawing, something that we need to we need to. Uh, Bring to the office, uh, bring bring to bring to the, to the school, right? Also, learning by doing, right? It's like it's a, something that we approach a lot in. Uh, we do a lot at, at the school. It's like you. I mean, it's it's very different when you are in a working environment and you have to just to provide for yourself. Whereas if you are in a working environment, but you are in a in a learning mindset, right? And our students go go for internships. They go to, to the best studios in the world to do the internship, but they are there in a in a in a they are working there and, and most of them get like stipends or just get supported by the offices but at the same time they are in a in a they are in a learning environment and they are free, they are freed from this problem of having to provide from themselves or having to uh get things done really really straight as they would do as they as if they were practitioners so that is something that we need to do and i don't think the companies are actually seeing the benefit or seeing seeing the opportunity here it's like when you approach certain problems as if you were in a learning environment rather than in a working environment, even though if you, at the end of the day, you have to, you have to provide, that is something that will allow you to actually innovate much faster to, uh, to create new, new, new models and to create new, new, um, uh, new ideas for your clients. I, I have students from IE working in, at Modelica and, I, and, and, and they always tend to seem to have like the best time of, of everyone in the office because they are always put into the projects that are high risk and, and 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 low paying right and they and they do such a they do such a great work because they have this time and they work on their own they write things down they try things they tinker all around and i i, and I wonder well i think i should be doing this myself i should i think I should, we should have like more people from the office working this way What's the cost? I mean, the cost is the, is the salary of them, but 
the outcome might be might be marvelous, might be marvelous, right? So yeah, I agree with you when you say that we should start stop thinking about um, I mean uh, this monolithic way of teaching, right? We have a different channels. We have also the work, the, the internship is a, is, a, is a great channel for learning. And we need to, to see learning as a long life uh, thing to happen. The difference is that in the first five years, you, it, it's going to happen on the IE or it's going to happen at the school. Uh, but it, 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 it needs to keep on happening after that. And I don't, I don't, think, I don't think many companies uh, and many studios have that embedded in their brains because you need to be constantly learning. You need to be constantly uh, understanding new things. You know, in, in, in the learning process, um, this constant learning process you describe, I, you know, the place where I'm most concerned about what we've lost, and I'm generally very optimistic about this hybrid format, but I know uh, from experience as a student uh, and, uh, and as a professor that a lot of learning takes place at strange hours in the design studio when students are working together, mm -hmm. random conversations and, and looking over the shoulder of somebody and seeing that they're working on something. There are those moments of random discovery and, and, and also interpersonal connections. I mean, sharing a studio space with somebody over a course of years, you really do develop um, you know, a meaningful relationship. And mm -hmm. This is the one thing, the studio culture, as we call it, right? The studio culture we have here, um, it's very common um, in, especially in American universities, but lots of, lots of places have it. Uh, mm. It's how I was educated. And it's one of the things that I'm very proud of that we have here at IE. And one of the things we're thinking about, we've just started a, a working group, is how can we keep that kind of community life alive? What can we do to have random encounters and, and that kind of closeness um, that comes from working close together. Right? Mm -hmm. I don't know if you have any, if you have any, uh, any ideas to that because it's, it's a big challenge to us because our education it, it, isn't just the stuff you learn. It's yeah, indeed it is. I mean, what, we can learn from uh, remote companies that are actually working from overseas, right? Uh, everywhere. Every, I mean, people stay at their hometown and they work remotely for the company, no matter where they are. And uh, we can we can see some some tricks that these companies apply. Of course, they have like annual meetings. They get uh, they get a get together and they go for fun. They go they have, they have discussions. Go right, uh, and those are really planned. Of course, we we have that with the, with the blended programs. We have that happening. But they also try to automate certain things that are that would happen otherwise in a, in a face-to-face -face environment, right? For instance, asking what, you, what's the, uh, what good film have you, have you recently seen or what did you do last weekend, right? That is something that some, some of these companies uh, automate that, those questions, just to make it raise uh, conversations that otherwise would, would happen on the, on that, uh, during lunchtime, right? So I'm not saying that that, that can be replaced by fully automated or uh, uh, communication systems, but they can be somehow, they, it can be, they can be helped uh, in, 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 in several ways. So I would look into, I would, I would, I would actually look up this, this, this type of companies, these ones, there are many out there. So they are spe especially proud about the way they work. Uh, but if you f go for, if you search for remote workplaces or remote companies, you will see there are, there are many other. I mean, there's one I, I really like a lot, which is called Basecamp. Uh, they are developers of a of a software for uh, for collaboration, and actually they're based out of Chica of Chicago. I mean, you, I don't know if you've heard of them, but uh, they, have, have. They, they have they are really <laughs> they are really advocates of this way of working and the asynchronous way of, of of working. And I think the the university is pretty. It's way closer to that than most of the companies out there, where there's a boss that is actually always rushing and has a client that it was was everything you know, for just today. I need it for just today. That doesn't happen really in 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 in, uh, in in school because we have deadlines. They are clear. We have tests. It's a, I think I think in some ways the future remote workplace should look more and more as as it does the university. It, that doesn't mean I don't I don't think there are many things in the university that should be change uh, and, and, and follow what we have in, 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 in the professional practice. But speaking about remote and speaking about collaboration, I think there are many, there are many ideas we should be uh, bringing from the school to the, to the professional practice. We also have some questions on the chat. Uh, I was expecting two questions from, from Nadine. But yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Nadine, um, you're out there. Yeah. The impact we see on freelancing and remote consulting, of course, remote consulting and, 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 and freelancing, it's, I think it's an anti-fragile, uh, uh, it's an anti-fragile thing. It's like, you don't need much to go to keep up working, right? The problem comes when you have a smaller, a small company, but for freelancing and remote consulting, I think we will be able to, get, to gather, to harvest jobs almost everywhere. You only have to, you only have to think about how you're going to develop your network beyond your physical reach, right? How you're going to be, be able to do that. And possibly you will have to travel, you have to fly uh, when this is over. But I think the, for many services, you're going to be, you're going to become, suddenly you're going to become accessible to the whole world. And that is really, really good for, for professional services firms like, like architectural offices. That is great. Mm. So Nadine is asking us about uh, what features should a home have uh, when crowds are not allowed in public spaces? How will cities and public spaces change? The home question is a very fraught question, I think, because um, this inevitably goes to questions of income inequality. And uh, I was reading an article recently where you know, the number of square meters uh, that a child has to play with is uh, in some countries, you know, there's the perfect relationship of income. In others, not so much, right? Uh, because in, in, let's say in Europe, where um, some of the highest, uh, the most expensive properties are apartments in the center of Madrid and people who live in rural areas have access to more land. But I think a lot of this kind of, um, let's say I would be concerned if one of the primary things we took from this was to isolate ourselves more in our houses and bring all the amenities of public life into our own houses. I would be concerned about this. It may happen, um, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't embrace it because I think part of what we've got to do is to find a way, uh, first of all, to understand this will pass, but there may be others, right? There may be other moments like this, but we've got to find, a, we, I don't think we should surrender entirely uh, our tradition of, of occupying public space and say, ah, it's got to be all in the home. I am more interested in what measures can we uh, take to create, uh, I don't know if we want to call it defensible space, but healthy public space, healthy public space in, in a way that we might internalize healthy design guidelines, just as we do uh, universal accessibility ability guidelines, right? You need to have a ramp. Well, you need to allow in this restaurant, you're going to have to allow for the vertical separation between diners or something like this. I mean, we may have to internalize certain design guidelines that are, we, we will figure out our good practice. But um, I think one of the interesting things will be the way that we can create public spaces that allow us to use them, even in a situation like the present. Mm -hmm. I would add to that, uh, David, that what I think, what I, I don't know what's going to happen, but what I see as a certain thing is that something like this will happen again uh, soon, right? Rather than later, right? So we need to be, you cannot get prepared for this, but you have, what you can do is you can, you can make it, uh, you can make things in a way that are, no matter what happens, you're going to stay robust, right? So speaking, thinking about houses is like, okay, just think that your house, whatever you design in the future, can suddenly become right a workspace, a nursing space, a learning space, right? Uh, and so we need to think about uh, we need to think of housing in the future as as a, as, a, as a unit, right? Uh, we might not be able to uh, to to live it in in in, in some in, in time. Of course, there are things about social distancing that are going to be affecting the way we work and the way we design. But the housing is like is is going to be key in the future for any, any new pandemic with that, I'm, I'm sure will happen. Maybe it will not happen in Spain, will not happen in, in, in Europe, but it will happen elsewhere, right? So we need to be uh, ready for that, ready to, to ha have the house become something much more important than that, right? As it is happening now, and, and many people are struggling with, with that. And the governments, we need to see that. Uh, social housing, we need to see to that, right? And we need, to, we need to take that into account for any future designs, of course. I'm actually, I'm actually, I think I'm going to sneak into the next design studio after the pandemic and see how <laughs> it has affected the, uh, the topics and the, and the discussions in there. It should be interesting. And, and my hope is that we, we internalize certain lessons from this and don't just go back to the way things were before. Mm -hmm. um, because I think we're learning some really valuable lessons that will prove useful to us in the other urgent crisis that we're facing that seems to be on the back burner at the moment. 
uh, and that it's reducing our carbon footprint. And um, that's that will very likely, uh, well, it should cause a similar reassessment of how we live and emergency measures, probably. Um, yeah, I, 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 I think that, that um, there's a comment saying something to that effect, right? That this lockdown, uh, it teaches us that we can do these things. It's painful, but we can do them if we need to. Mm -hmm. There's another interesting thing that you say about the, the house being, you know, uh, flexible. And I think this is another, that would be a good lesson. And also um, that it, I think you use the word robustness. If we have loose fitting buildings, rather than specific buildings with specific rooms for specific purposes. Mm -hmm. You know, a loose fit building, a loft kind of building, actually allows us um, a building that is more sustainable because it's more likely to be adaptable over time. And the example I would use is from my city, sort of these industrial loft buildings that were for storage in the 19th century uh, are now offices and, and homes. It's very unlikely that these palatial suburban houses in the suburbs of Chicago, if the living model changes, will be of use to anyone much at all because they're fit to one purpose. They're, they're unlikely to be adaptable. And that's you know, not a very smart thing to do in terms of our footprint, right? Because you're mm -hmm. going to tear down a building every 30 years. So there's, there's a way in which our concerns, I hope there's a way we can address the concerns, the pandemic concerns, and also carbon footprint concerns. Mm -hmm. Because we're we're really facing overlapping crises here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's uh, again uh, without diminishing the dramatic uh, situation. No, it's like it's actually helping us to understand better the economics we're having. Of course, it's impacting trouble as uh, Lorenzo is, uh, is is reflecting on in the, on, on the on the on the chat. But we we think about the real estate bubble trouble, the um, the role of the house. Also, speak about. I would like to think about in, in, in developed countries we we're getting older and older people living in uh, in their houses and and i don't think we have enough houses in, in at least in spain for hosting the the aging population right and that that's that, that needs to change as well and what i like to see is architects as how may might say in the chat like uh, thinking or or looking into it out like outside the box, being more comprehensive into the way they look into a problem, think more about economics, think of, th think more about the uh, the impact in a social level of what, of what they do, not just stay within their sandbox of, uh, of of design. And and that I think that's our main challenge is like understanding that what we are players in a in in a in a complex problem that involves many different different uh, different disciplines, many different uh, different ideas, many different concepts, and we have to we have to get it. We have to solve it. We try to solve it, although it might not be solvable in in, in the short term. Right. We have a, a question from Sebastian, good friend from Portland. Hello, Sebastian. Uh, Sebastian, the question is is you know will the can uh, this moment lead us to understand space that's not necessarily about the physical i guess that's what i'm what what, uh, what you're getting at some 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 idea that that the way we work together um now is not defined by walls but we are in a space right and and, and i think this goes to a question i raised earlier with Roberto about the design of virtual spaces and i think we haven't thought much about them um and i think this two things need Need to happen. We we need. I think we need a little jump in the, in the technology. Not huge, but I, I think that that still. I mean, like virtual reality has gotten so much better just in the past couple of years. Uh, really, I mean, in five years, it's an entirely different thing. Uh, and we can already. We have already begun some some kind of pilot uh, studies of how we can have virtual classrooms where, let's say, a student. Um, we want to go see their model and they upload their model and we all have with our goggles we go into the model like mm -hmm. we're, we're looking in we all okay let's reconvene the studio session in Roberto's model and we go um, and, and and it could lead us to think about um, creating those virtual spaces let's say when we go it's going to sound a little banal but when we go to Amazon you know the way we interface with our online shopping experience for example is it, 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 it's pretty banal it's pretty basic mm -hmm. uh, and that kind of experience those kind of virtual spaces I think architects could be um, involved in designing those not only related to um, to shopping I mean what about the classroom 
what about spaces uh, of faith, you know, religious spaces? Uh, if we can't all be together in a religious space, and what does that look like? So there's a way that I think we could, uh, we have a, a big role to play in, in mm -hmm. the design of virtual spaces. Definitely, definitely, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, we have uh, three, four, five more minutes. Uh, any more questions from you guys? It's like, how are you coping up with this uh, situation? How how prepared are you for remote work after the after the pandemic? I'm to, I'm asking in terms of uh, not only infrastructure and technology, but also in terms of policy on how you uh, implement communication protocols and how you deal with your with your clients and with your collaborators. Hmm. Juan, a very good question. I mean, I would advise you to just, I mean, actually take a break with that and, and, and educate your clients, right? The clients need to be educated. Uh, they actually want to be educated by you because you are not a, uh, you are not a football player. You are not a, a, a writer, right? You, you have to educate them because they don't know nothing about architecture as you do. So they need to be educated and they also need to be educated in the way you interact with them. So just try to stop and, 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 and I, I will advise you to do that exercise. Just try and explain to them how you're going to collaborate and try to write it down and send it, send it to them, right? Like having this working agreement or co collaboration agreement beforehand. It's something that we, we think, we tend to think that we are, we were trained on how to collaborate, but that's not the deal, in, especially not using these technologies. So, and everybody tries to do their best. So I would advise that you should uh, in trying to implement this kind of agreement beforehand, and I, I'm sure you will see a lot of benefit and improvement. Okay, so I think there were quite a few questions there. Uh, thank you so much, Roberto and uh, David, for this fantastic dialogue again. Uh, I think we've tackled many things that uh, we could maybe initially think that were linked to architecture, but not at all exclusive to architecture. So many, many, many other topics are really relevant for all of us. I'm not an architect myself, so uh, they were very relevant in any case. And, um, and thank you to all the audience uh, there that has been connected. All through the session, everybody was quiet, listening, concentrated, so they were all connected, nobody disconnected. So that's a very good uh, feeling of, of, of the interest of the session. So um, uh, we've shared the link, you can see it, you can see it uh, on, the, on the chat, we've, we've shared the link where you can see, you will be able to see the recording of the sessions and, and, and the other sessions within the Leading Complex Science uh, Dialogues series, okay? In, in a couple of days, the, um, the recording will be ready because we have to edit it a little bit. And uh, well, um, that's it for today. Thank you to the School of Architecture and Design. And uh, well, uh, keep safe, take care, and uh, let's keep in touch. Thank, Thank you. you, David. Thank you, Roberto. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. Stay safe. Bye-bye, Bye -bye, guys. Yeah. Thank you. Live long and prosper, Roberto. Yeah. <laughs>